Well, Van is uh, obviously a great coach. Got to do it with supreme focus, right? With razor sharp focus. Breathe what he's breathing. But he's a better, a better person. The biggest thing you gave me was time. You didn't really know me. We were from the same neighborhood and area, but I was with a group of guys that wanted to go to college, wanted to play ball. And you actually gave us that reality that, hey, this can actually happen because we saw somebody that was like us and that we wanted to become. Recruiting is about relationships. It's built on trust. It's built on doing the right things. And it's built on your head coaches and your athletic direct director, their vision. And I think we have two great leaders, both of those positions. So it makes it easy for me to go out and, and do what I do. Be aggressive. Let's win. Here we go. Once again, I'm excited to have another leader in the world of sports on Leaders Lead with Van Malone. Coaches and administrators across the country on all levels and in different sports have enjoyed the great insight that we continue to share on this podcast. It also has been remarkable, a great experience for me perfect, personally. We've had the chance to share with conference commissioners, athletic directors, head coaches, We've even had a recently crowned Super Bowl champion NFL coach grace our podcast. Our next guest, Joe Callgard, has had a terrific career as an administrator. He's held positions in some of the top athletic departments across the country. He took over as athletic director at Rice in the fall of 2013 and has seen dynamic transformations in the Owls athletic department. Joe, thanks for coming on. I'm really happy to be here today, Van. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom and insight with us. It's funny, when we think about, you know, our path, and especially me, sometimes we find ourselves in places we never thought we'd be. In my wildest dreams as a student athlete, I never thought I would have coached at Mississippi State University. Uh, I'm curious, though, about your path. Because when I research you, when I read about you, I find out that your path is a little bit different. You knew what you wanted to do because of your father. Talk to us about your journey from a former college athlete to becoming an athletics director. Well, thanks, Van. Um, I, I grew up in North Dakota, and my dad was a high school athletics director. Uh, and so from a very young age, you know, I spent time on his hip at every athletics contest that you could think of, football games, track meets, uh, wrestling matches, hockey games, what have you, and uh, really fell in love with competition and athletics. And um, in college, I went to Stanford and competed in track and field. I was a 800 meter runner who uh, somehow wedged his way onto the mile relay most, most meets, uh, usually because someone else was hurt or not feeling well, and so I was the next man up. Um, but, you know, that combination of, of my upbringing, uh, you know, growing up in the family where, where dad was, uh, you know, he'd coached before becoming an AD and then became an AD, and then my experience in college really led me to where I am today, which is, you know, being a college AD. So. Um, I had an unbelievable experience as a student athlete uh, and, you know, sort of knew what, what, um, what I wanted to do from the moment I, I became involved in Division I athletics as a student athlete. And, uh, you know, combining that with my dad's uh, wisdom and experience as an athletics director uh, led me to this point. Cool. So I, I, I really, I like to ask administrators this question. But, you know, when you were a player, even, even a runner, it's the yell of the crowd that, that gets your juices going. As a coach, it's seeing the light, the light bulb go off in a player's life, whether that be on the field or off the field. But, but what is game day for an administrator? Where does your thrill come from? My thrill um, – really comes from those moments where, uh, where I know the culmination of all of the hard work uh, of our coaches and student athletes and all the adversity that they've been through 
uh, in their lives, in their, in their journeys, uh, in practice, in the classroom, through injuries and what have you, uh, where they get to experience success at a high level. When you see that, um, being able to share in that <clears throat> is just extraordinarily powerful. And, uh, you know, I, I always enjoy, too, the, the moments where they, uh, the student athletes come back, you know, five and 10 years down the road and they're successful. And, and you know that their experience as a student athletes uh, contributed to their current level of success. But on game day for me, it's when, it's when I see somebody who I know has overcome a lot uh, or I, who, who I know has just put in an extraordinary amount of work, have that success, and that really gives me a thrill. Mm. All right. So we, we are digging into 2021. And, of course, there, you in Texas and Houston, you've had your share of adversity even, even now. But when we think about 2020, we're talking about politics, we're talking about racial discussions, we're talking about the name, image, likeness, discussion blowing up. We're talking about transfer portals. There have been a ton of adversities across the spectrum. But how do you think creating meaningful initiatives and COVID protocols in 2020, how do you think those things have made you a better leader? That's a great question. You know, I, I think, um, most people that I talk to who, um, you know, either have served as mentors of mine or uh, are colleagues in the industry, be they uh, other administrators or coaches, you know, they love to game plan. They love to strategize. You love to think about, okay, if we do this and this and this over the course of the next couple of years, I think we can accomplish great things. And I think what, what COVID has taught us uh, is that you have to be very flexible in your thinking and that there will always be moments throughout your life, whether it's um, in your personal life or, or professional life, where you're going to have to read and react uh, and you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to do it with humility because uh, it's not going to be something that, that you plan for. And, you know, so I think We've, we've rolled with the punches throughout the course of 2020 uh, through all of the things that, that, you know, that you mentioned, uh, you know, and that's extending into 2021. And I just have to remind myself that, um, you know, that for, for me and for our staff to, to, um, to serve our student athletes well, uh, we have to constantly be mindful of the stress that they're under and that they don't have the same level of life experience that we may have. And so we have to be very flexible and adaptable uh, in the way that we put things together to make sure that they can be as successful and healthy as possible. I, I would totally agree. Uh, for, for me as a coach, for, for our staff here at Kansas State, um, we, had to, we had to learn a different way to teach. You know, we, we had to learn a different way to communicate, you know, as you communicate on Zoom and try to teach someone to to block the three technique on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> and not ever been done before in coaching. And so the, the things that you spoke of, they definitely they translate it to to our lives as as coaches. But you said something that was that was key and that we have learned is flexibility. Flexibility uh, has been a, a, a big, big word, you know, in our staff rooms. Well, <clears throat> you, you were one of the first signatories of the Collegiate Coaching Diversity Pledge. What does this mean to you? And what do you think, what do you think that, that it means to the NCAA as a whole? Or what could it possibly mean to the NCAA as a whole? Well, I, I worked with uh, with the folks at ADU um, in trying to design um, a pledge, a commitment to diversity practices and hiring that would uh, that would have some accountability and stickiness to it. And you know, I know that um, in college athletics, we all work within the frameworks of our universities. Uh, we've got the conferences, and so, you know, different conferences are doing different things. Um, you know, I know the West Coast Conference has gone and done their own thing. And then we're within the framework of the NCAA. 
we talked about various things uh, that we could do, but really it was, it was the public statement and accountability uh, that was important to us. And so, you know, we've gotten a number of people who've signed up for this. You know, my hope is that uh, that in combination with some of the efforts uh, of LEAD One and the NCAA, um, some of the, the, the efforts of MOA and minority coaching associations that have, are really trying to do things to promote uh, candidates who may otherwise be overlooked, that all of those things will come together and that we'll see a, a, a broader uh, diversity of candidates interviewed for key positions. I think if that happens over time, I'm, I'm confident that we'll start to see some of the changes that, we've, uh, that are long overdue and that we've all wanted to see. You know, uh, Richard Labchek at, at the University of Central Florida puts out a, a report card every year. And, um, you know, the, the report card generally isn't good. You don't see a lot of A's and B's uh, in hiring practices. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think that's just a constant reminder that we're not doing enough. And so um, in signing this pledge, you know, we've made a commitment here um, and it goes beyond. I mean, we signed the pledge for, for the sports that are involved. I think it's football, men's and women's basketball, but it really goes beyond that. It goes to marketing positions and facilities, associate ADs, et cetera, that we are committed to, um, over time, to ensuring that, that our coaching staff and administrative staff, staff is better representative of the student athletes we serve. I totally agree, and, and I 100% and I applaud you and your department for the work that you're doing. And I, I've always said, as I've talked to different leaders and different people about the subject of diversity, is that it, diversity, there is strength in diversity. You know, you, you, when you have an opportunity to see things with a broad vision, then I think you, you, you give yourself strength when you make decisions. But I understand, <clears throat> I understand that in, in times of trouble, right, when you lose your coach, when you lose a person in one of those key positions, that's a stressful time. And so what is most comforting in those stressful times is that we go to what we know. We go to what we're most familiar with. And so uh, we just have to, as a society, really, we have to be willing to to stretch our boundaries, to stretch ourselves, to have a broader vision. And I think people like you and the Diversity Pledge and the NCAA and the Minority Coaching Associations are, are in place to be able to do that, to, to stretch our boundaries, to force us to think of of a broader way to do things. And I think that comes in hiring and it also comes in the, in the interview process. One of the things I really liked about uh, signing the, the pledge was that it, it forces preparation because you just hit on something, Van, that to me is, is part of the problem. You know, when you're under stress, when you're looking for a football coach, let's say you've got to make a hire in a week or 10 days, you know, kind of maximum two weeks. And, you know, you're sort of mining the networks that you've got. Sometimes it's an expected departure. Sometimes it's not. Right. But if you're not prepared in that situation, then you're right. You're going to go to what's comfortable for you. Right. And I think in signing the pledge, what I've committed to is making sure that the next time we have turnover in one of those positions, that I'm well prepared and that I've networked well so that I can bring a diverse set of candidates to the table. Right. And I, and I think that's huge. And and. You know, a lot, a lot of people get it misconstrued, um, but that's the bottom line. That's the ultimate goal is to bring a diverse set of candidates to the pool. Now, we've had some awesome leaders on, on, this, on this podcast, and we've exchanged ideas about really the best strategies to improve leadership. And they, most of the leaders always point back to someone who has helped them to learn the fine art of leading his people or her people. Who has been the best leader that you've been around? And what are some of the things that that person taught you? That's a great question. Uh, and it's hard to boil it down to a, a single figure. 
Um, I'm going to mention uh, three people, and then I'll, I'll go maybe a little deeper on one of them. Okay. Um, so my, my head track coach at Stanford was a guy named Vin Lanana. Uh, coach Lanana was uh, the head coach at Dartmouth for a while and then went to Stanford. Um, then he, he uh, became the head coach at Oregon, and now he's the director of track and field at the University of Virginia. Uh, he was the 2016 men's Olympic coach. Uh, he's been president of USA Track and Field. Um, great guy and, and certainly a mentor of mine. Um, Bob Bowlesby, who's the commissioner of the Big 12 band, you probably know Bob yes. um, since you're in his league. But Bob, Bob brought me back to Stanford in, in 2011. Uh, so I worked for him for about a year and a half or two years. Um, learned a lot about uh, you know, just about his experience and kind of the, the even keelness with which he approached the job. And then Bernard Muir, uh, the current athletics director at Stanford, who I got a chance to work for for about a year. Uh, learned, learned a lot about kind of fresh approaches from him. Um, and I, I brought a lot of that to, uh, to, to what, I've, um, what I've done here at Rice. But I think Coach Lanana really is the person probably who's had the greatest impact on my life. And that's just because I've known him for 25 years. And, um, you know, what he taught me, um, I think more than anything, is something that I've carried with me through every aspect of my life. And that's just that, that the ability to really be self-aware and to, um, to, to ask yourself really hard questions about your motivations about your commitment towards achievement. Um, Coach Lanana was really great at getting me to realize that there was always more that I could do. Uh, there was always farther that I could stretch myself uh, as an athlete. And I've, I've carried those things over. I'm not always perfect at, at asking those questions or stretching myself in that way, but it certainly is a framework that I've, I've relied upon and used throughout the rest of my life. And I'll, I'll always be grateful to him for that. Yeah. So I've had opportunity, of course, to talk to a lot of great leaders, but I read a lot of leadership books. And, and as I read these books and I talk to people, they always, they always use the bus reference, getting the right people on your bus and talking about how that is so important for the success of the organization, of the department, of the team. And each, each person, like I said, they go back to these books that I read about not necessarily where you put them, but that you get the right people on the bus. So when you're hiring a new coach or new staff member, how do you identify who, who will be the best addition to your bus, your organization? I think the first thing I look for, Van, is, uh, is authenticity. Um, I need somebody, uh, you know, whether it's a coach or, or an entry-level administrator um, who, uh, who can be themselves, who, who uh, walks the talk, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what I've, what I've come to understand is that in, in working in college athletics or probably any industry, you're going you're gonna to encounter many different types of people and many different personalities. And you need to be good at working with different types of people. Um, you know, to truly have a, a, a diverse and cohesive organization, you know, to have those things at the same time, you can't have, you know, 50 of the same type of person. You want different perspectives. You want different viewpoints. You want different backgrounds. Um, but so I embrace that part of it and think that that ultimately makes an organization healthy. But authenticity is so important because I need to know, you can't build trust if somebody's not authentic. Right. And so I need to know that they're always gonna shoot me straight, uh, that they're always going to uh, be comfortable being themselves, and if they're not, that they, that they can talk to me about that so that we can create an environment where they can do that. Um, I, I think that authenticity is huge. I, I think adaptability is also big. You know, we just talked about COVID and you know, going through 2020. And I think having employees and colleagues who are adaptable to the environment, who, who realize that, you know, life is always changing. Uh, that's the only certainty in life is that everything changes. And so being able to adapt to that uh, is super important to me. So those would be the kind of the two qualities 
uh, that I look for most. And I think if you get those, I think there's, a, there's a lot of different roles that you can plug people into uh, as long as they can be authentic and adaptive. Okay. Now you, you spoke earlier about your relationship with ADU and in an article you wrote uh, to your younger self mm -hmm. and you gave, you said your first piece of advice was to let your authority as a leader come to you naturally. Talk, talk about that and, and then talk about how you've changed since your first job. My first job uh, as an athletics director was uh, at Division Three Overland College in Northeast Ohio. I got the job when I was uh, about 30 years old. I had no experience supervising anybody. I, I think I'd maybe overseen a couple of student workers in my time, but you know, I'd never hired a coach before. I uh, never let anybody go. Um, and I, I was convinced that I needed to make my mark uh, by showing people how tough I was, by showing people that I knew all the answers. And it backfired. You know, there are a lot of people around me who knew a lot more than I did about certain things. And, you know, rather than try to um, bring them in in a more inclusive decision making process, I went top down. And I think I really eroded a lot of trust uh, as a result of that. I, I didn't, you know, key allies that I could have. Uh, uh, you know, fostered relationships with in our department. Um, I didn't do that. Instead, I, you know, I, I, I tried to uh, be more of a authoritarian. And um, as a result, you know, it took me a long time really to try and have a relationship with those people. And, and as a result, our decisions, the decisions I made, uh, weren't as good as the decisions that I made later on in my career. I sort of look at, at that job as you know, act one and act two, the first three years and kind of the second three years. And I think I figured it out after three years of trial and error that that really wasn't going to work and, and became uh, better at, um, at being, um, you know, kind of just being vulnerable and saying, hey, you know what, I, I, I'm not sure I know the right answer to this, but I think if, if, if you can help me figure it out and you can help me figure it out and you can help me figure it out, we together, we can get to the right place. That's really how you build great teams, right? Right. You know, if, if people, if people walk that journey uh, together, uh, then when you're going through adversity, um, they'll stick together. Uh, and ultimately, you know, you're going to get, as, as you pointed out earlier, Van, you want that broad perspective on that's how you come up with the best decisions because other people may see things that I just simply can't see because of my experience. So, um, so that's really what I was talking about. Uh, and I, I think, you know, authority comes to you uh, through the, the, the relationships that you build, not through uh, your, your, the knowledge that you have. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that actually, you actually stole my next question. Um, I, the next thing that I was going to refer to was was your mention of making the mistake of leaving staff members out of the discussion, but then you 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 hit it when you talked about the diversity of thought. And and okay, earlier we talked about it really from a maybe a race and a gender standpoint, but then you came back and talked about how you you made a mistake by not trusting your teammates, right? Not trusting your, the, the people who were in the boat with you. Uh, and you made the decision with, uh, really with blinders on, whereas you could have had a more diverse um, thought, you know, as you, as you made the decision. So now what we want to do is let's move to today and let's think about your staff. How would, how would your staff describe your leadership style today and how has it changed over the years? Uh, I would hope that my staff would describe me as an increasingly inclusive leader. Um, you know, I, I view this as a journey, uh, you know, sort of the old, um, the old saw that, you know, we're, we're after perfection and along the way we'll catch excellence. You know, you never quite get to the destination and so when I think about me as a leader, I don't think I'll ever arrive as a leader. Um, I, I look at it as a, um, you know, as a journey where I'm constantly trying to get better. I'm, I'm 46 years old. 
I hope that I'm a very different and better leader at 56 than I am at 46. And I'm pretty sure I'm a better leader today than I was when I was 36. Um, so I, I think they describe me as, as someone who's evolving, someone who listens um, uh, well, someone who's inclusive, uh, and someone who's, who's better today than he was a year ago or two years ago. And if they said that about me, I'd, I'd be very pleased. Um, I, 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 I like to, um, you know, I like to surround myself with people who, uh, who have better subject matter expertise than I do. So, you know, I've got a, a, some great people on, on my senior staff who know more about their particular area than I ever could have imagined, uh, you know, knowing myself. And so, uh, you know, I have to listen to them and I have to trust. Them. Uh, and that extension of trust, I think, comes back to you. You know, if you trust people, uh, then they ultimately will trust you. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that, uh, that I'm continuing to evolve as a leader. And, and that's how I view myself. And I hope the, the staff would say that about me too. Well, Joe, I, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your insight. And uh, I'm sure that Anyone who watches this will, will, will gain a lot from it. Uh, I, being, a, being a Houston resident at heart, um, I, I definitely am always and always have been a, a Rice Owl fan. I've known coaches over the years and know some of the coaches on your staff today. One of my best friends is a, is a, Owl, a former uh, player for the Owls. You were at Oberlin College just before a young man I coached in high school, Kwame Semper. Now, actually, you were after Kwame. And, uh, man, it's where I learned of Oberlin is, is him going and, and playing football and graduating from there. And uh, so I, I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to continuing to watch your career. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully stay in contact with you. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate you having me on. And, and please know that I will always pull for Kansas State uh, because I grew up in North Dakota and I'm a huge Chris Kleiman fan. And after spending a half hour with you, I'm a huge Van Malone fan, too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I tell you what, if you know Chris Kleiman, man, you, you, you've been blessed uh, every day in this, in this role that I have uh, as assistant head coach. Now, as an assistant coach, y you have a lot of opinions about how things should be run what should happen uh he shouldn't have made that decision why did we do that but when you have the opportunity that, that he's given me you know to, to partner with him as we run our program i've had opportunity to to see a lot of things sometimes he sends me into the meetings with gene and uh <laughs> you know, i'm saying no no you're the head coach <laughs> but it's, it's been a lot of fun well thanks again i appreciate you and uh, have a great day. You too, man.